in all its glory. How many people are familiar with what DAX is? Hey, how many have actually used DAX for building calculations? OK, great. Uh, so this session was, is originally is numbered 408, so 400 level course. We'll likely start out with 100, go to 200, 300. We'll reach our altitude will be around 350. Maybe based on the question, there may be turbulence, so we go up to 400. But we'll go back down on 350, around that much. Uh, if you are familiar with DAX, if you already know concepts such as filter context, or row context, uh, I would advise that you look for a different session, uh, just, just to set expectations right. Now, so I am uh, Ashwini. I'm uh, a lead PM on analysis services. And uh, my team manages the engine for analysis services and power pivot. This is Casper. He's a program manager. Uh, working with the, on the experience side. So a lot of the manageability experience is what Casper owns. You, there's Julie here also. I'll just point out Julie to you because she's sitting in the back. She owns a lot of the user experience as well. Great. So going on, this is what we'll be talking about today. Very quickly, Power Pivot. Uh, we'll talk about DAX calculations themselves. And there's something new called DAX as a query language that we'll, talk, we'll dig into also. Most of this will be a demo. Uh, I think, uh, Julie's session, you had, what, 90 slides or something? 92, 92 slides? Uh, she, no, she didn't really. She said she had 92 slides. She had two, actually. We have about eight slides. So most of it will be Casper doing his work. And I'm going to, just to keep it more interactive, I'm going to pretend to be his manager, which I'm not. I'm just going to pretend to be his manager. So Casper, I have, uh, I have a problem, which is, uh, I need to go to my uh, meeting with the board of directors tomorrow. And uh, we need to do some analysis of uh, our sales in different countries. We're looking to go into a different country. And I just can't find it in my reports. My corporate reports don't have this data. So uh, I, what are you working on now? Well, actually, I'm just working on upgrading our data warehouse. You see, I'm working with an SSIS to upgrade the data warehouse. And I'm really deep into the matter because next month we have a new HR system coming out. And we want to make sure that we can refresh our data warehouse. So I'm heads down in scripts, SSIS, everything you can think of. Okay. Well, so if you can, if yeah. you can wait, please. Uh, actually, no, I can't, I can't really because I have a meeting tomorrow morning. I'm not ready for it at all. So if you could please uh, give me an hour, two hours maybe, we'll just try to get something done. And then hopefully you can go back to data warehousing. Well, uh, so what was the information you wanted to know? I want some sales information. I, I have a report with the printout of the sales info. I don't know where you got this from. But I just need this. I want to do some analysis, some profit analysis on this uh, for different countries. So if you can bring it up. So, well, luckily I know that this information is in our data warehouse. And I know of a way to get this information out. Mm -hmm. So I have um, on my computer also installed Excel 2010. I went to the internet, downloaded the Power Pivot add-in for free, installed it on my machine, and now I've added an extra tab in my Excel 2010, which is the Power Pivot tab. And with Power Pivot, you can analyze data on the spot, getting the information from everywhere. In this case, I'll be using information from our data warehouse, but you could also use information from Excel, Teradata, uh, Word files, OData feeds, anything you can think of, you can mix and match information. So what, it, what we're going to do here is I'm going to open up the Power Pivot window, and this will be like the analysis services engine running inside Excel. And this means I can get the information from all the sources into my Excel add-in. Mm -hmm. So in this case, and I can show you, we have a lot of information. We have SQL Server, Azure, Oracle, Teradata, Informix, all those sources you can pull into analysis services, uh, Power Pivot. And what this means is when I pull this information in, I actually mean we get all the data from our data sources and get it into the add-in. And once we get it into the end, the information will be loaded in the memory of my machine. And because we use a, a column-based compression method, we can get a lot of information inside the memory of my machine. On this machine, 4 gigabytes of RAM, I have had information with 200 uh, million rows and still could work. So what we did here is I imported some tables from my data warehouse. And as you can see, I have the customer table, date table, products promotions, 
sales territory, all this information that we wanted to know. And because we imported information from a SQL Server relational data source, Power Pivot automatically knows that there are relationships between those. Because we want to get information and we want to combine from multiple different tables, and Power Pivot can do that automatically for you. So let's switch to the diagram. And on the diagram, we can actually see how all the tables are and how they are related to each other. In this case, we can see in fact internet sales is related to products, and products is again related to subcategories. And so we have tables which are imported, we have relationships which are automatically imported, but you can also create them manually so by just dragging and dropping into the other column uh, if you don't have relationships by default. So we have tables, we have relationships, and let's say for example here I have my fact internet sales, and so what information did you want to see here? So we have sales amount, we have total product cost. Okay, yeah, profit. I want to do profit analysis. So can you just create a... Okay, so profit is something we don't have in our data warehouse, but we always do in our, in our cubes before we prepare our corporate reports. So I need to add something to my model here. And we can add things to the model by creating a calculated column. And a calculated column lets us enrich our tables. So we can do right mouse click, insert column, and this will add a calculated column. And adding a calculated column is just as simple as I want to subtract the sales amount with the total product cost. Press enter, and now it will evaluate this formula and execute this formula for each and every row inside this table. And the values that are, that are returned are actually stored in memory inside this table. At the moment that I create it, or when I refresh this table. So this means all this information is stored in memory. So when users want to use it, it's, it's just as fast as it would be any other column inside this uh, database. Mm -hmm. So if I have, in Excel, I can do something very similar, which is I have a table and I define calculations next to it. But sometimes, you know, the rows of the table go away or some new rows are yes. added and my calculations so, get messed up. So what we did here is um, we worked very closely with the Excel team and Power Pivot is very Excel related. So formulas and functions you create uh, work just like in Excel. So in Excel, if you, were, you create a function, you drag it down, this gets evaluated for each and every row. The same thing here. So you probably also know of the VLOOKUP function in Excel, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in Power Pivot, we can do this easier than in VLOOKUP does because we have tables and we have relationships. So we can leverage that information. So let's say, you, as we just saw, we, ha we had here in fact, internet sales, we have products, we have subcategories, and those are all related. So let's, just for the fun of it, go to dim product and add a new column, which gives us the name of the subcategory. So we see here the column, which is the, the relationship with the subcategory, and now I just want to get the value from the subcategory. I can just do is related uh, dim product subcategory and give me the subcategory name. Press enter. And now we, we use the relationship to navigate and get other data in this table. So just like VLOOKUP, we can do related. Uh, only we just, it's much easier because we use the, the modeling features, we use the relationships that are between tables. Okay, great. So we're looking at, uh, this is all role level data, this is all transactional data and individual products. What about group by? If I just want to see profit per different uh, country, how do I do that? Yes, so right now we're in the Power Pivot window. And in the Power Pivot window, we, we create the model. We create the tables, we create the relationships, we do the modeling operations. But if we actually want to do the analytics, we go to our good old Excel. So I create a pivot table in the existing workbook, and again, here we now see all the tables. We see customers, dates, employees, products. So all the tables we see here are in my pivot table as well. So let's say I want to add the gross profit or the profit. Profit. I can drag it into values and now it will automatically add it. Yeah, oh, sorry. Now it will automatically add it to the pivot table. So what we see here is I didn't have to do anything. I created a calculated column, which was profit. I dragged it in and now it automatically get, creates a measure for me. It does the sum of profit. And this is the profit of the entire table, all in one shot. And it 
automatically calculated on the fly over those, all those rows. Mm -hmm. So it's very fast. And I can show you here what it actually does. So what it does is implicitly we create a measure called sum of factory internet sales profit. And we can change that as well. We can do a count, a min, a max, an average, or even a distinct count. And just like this, do a distinct count over, over something and it automatically works. So people who are familiar with analysis services will know this is a great improvement and it makes things very easy if you want to do a distinct count. And I can have as many distinct counts as I want. And you can have as many distinct, okay, yeah. distinct counts as you want. Okay. So we have the sum of gross profit. So now we want to put it, the countries against it. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the country table, sales territories, and drag the countries on rows. And now you automatically see the rows are being added to our countries, and the sum of gross profit is automatically calculated for each and every of those countries. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to write any code. It automatically knows because we created those relationships between those tables. So what we al also can do is uh, we can add more to it. Yeah, how about by years? Uh, can you just per, for different years of different countries? Yes, so I can add other things as well. In this case, drag in calendar year, it automatically shows me the sum of sales amount for each combination of those two. Mm -hmm. So each cell is being calculated automatically by what's on row and filters. In this case, France is calculated, uh, for this cell is being calculated by France for 2001. So all of these things are automatically done by Power Pivot for you. Because we have created a model with relationships and tables, we don't have to do anything here. Okay, how about product? Uh, do you have any product line information? Let's add that. Yes, so let's search within the product line. We do have a product line. So I know okay. those managers, they always yes. want to change on the fly, so let's add it as a slicer. Something else we did introduce in Excel 2010 was called, this is called a slicer. So let's drag in a slicer. Let's make it a little bit smaller. So these are slicers, and what slicers do is make a slice of your data. In this case, when I select R, you see the data change. Now, automatically, the data is being filtered by what's on row and columns, 2001 Australia, and also for product line R, product line S, product line M. So you automatically can play around with what, what the data you have, and you have some sort of parameter options. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Oh yeah, any questions so far? So we covered tables, relationships, we covered implicit measures, drag and dropping of a column onto the values, automatically got a sum. We covered slicers, we covered pivot table as well. Any questions so far? This is just the basic, yes. So what would be the size of this Excel sheet? Well, um, the, the engine that is running inside Excel when data load gets loaded, it will also compress the data. So it, it kind of depends on, how much, on what kind of data you have, but this, most of the times you can think of a compression rate of 10 times, and, but also sometimes we heard in, in, in an IC session on Monday it was, or Tuesday, there can be compression rates of th up to 300 times. Yeah, sometimes so it's down to six, sometimes up to 300, depends on your data. Yes, so what it does, it, it compares the values in each columns, and if it has a lot of the same values in those columns, it can compress more. Right. And that's essentially, one of the things you're pointing out is key to Power Pivot. That is, all the data that is in Power Pivot, all the connection info, all the metadata is saved within the Excel workbook. So when I email that over to somebody else or I put it up in SharePoint, everything goes along with it. So they can refresh it as well. Um, for what you have on the screen right now of the actual uh, pivot table, mm -hmm. Great, great, good question. So the question is, this view that we've got, the pivot table, how does this relate to the power pivot window that we saw? So remember what Casper uh, did was he launched power pivot window from within Excel. Everything I'm doing in that power pivot window will be saved with the Excel file, right? Yes. Just one workbook. No, it's not a worksheet list. It's an actual, a separate, uh, we, we, as the analysis service team, created an add-in within Excel. So we don't keep the data inside Sheets. We keep the data inside our own environment. And Excel connects to our environment. 
So the, the data. The reason is Excel is limited to a million rows, right, or sheet. So Casper already mentioned that we can go up much higher than you know, 200 million, et cetera. So we do have our own uh, engine that's running within Excel, which is loading all the data and making it available for querying by Excel. So you can have a lot more data compressed fairly substantially, uh, and then you can define calculations within that database itself. Like the calculated column that he defined was on that data, the embedded database, and then he's using it within uh, Power Pivot. Show them side by side. Are you going to throw any koalas out this time? I ran out. You ran out. Come on, man. Yeah, so they're, so they're separate, but they're also combined. Yeah. OK, there's one more question up here somewhere. Or did that answer it? Uh, well, I guess it's sort of you. If, if I put that on SharePoint site, does the other user have to have power pivot to take advantage of pivoting around? No. If, uh, at the moment that, at, uh, at the moment that you, you just repeat the question. Yeah. So if you publish it to SharePoint, do the people who connect to SharePoint need Power Pivot as well. So when you share something, a Power Pivot file to SharePoint, it will become an interactive web application. So when you share to SharePoint, it becomes HTML. If you keep it on SharePoint, well, people... So if you email it to someone, then they, that person needs uh, Power Pivot as well, because it needs to connect to the en Power Pivot engine, which you only get when you install the add-in. Okay, one more last question, then we'll need to move on. Is a roll app queue? Yeah. Yes. So it, so when when you import information into Power Pivot, it actually pulls the data into Power Pivot and keeps it there until you refresh it. So it it's, it sends those queries once, and then only when you ask for it, it will refresh the data. Okay, so now we're going up to the 200 level. Uh, so, Casper, how, how does Power Pivot know that for that cell, the highlighted cell, it should be calculating data for Canada in 2001? So, one of the most important concepts in Power Pivot is filter context. And this is what I just talked about is when you put a measure inside the Power Pivot uh, field list and in the Power Pivot window, it automatically knows what it's surrounding it. So and I can actually, actually I have. A, just a minute. So I just want to be clear. A lot of people will never go beyond this point, right? They will just create calculated columns. They'll create calculated measures. Be very happy with it, and uh, never have to discover the notion of what is a filter context. That's what we're getting into now. This is key to the design of DAX. This is very important for you to grok, uh, as opposed to MDX, which is another calculation language that we have, where you have to learn about. What is a dimension? What is a level? What is a hierarchy? All these concepts up front before you can start using the, uh, the power of the engine. DAX, the key design point of DAX is if you know Excel, you can start with DAX right away. Right? And a lot of people will just say, OK, fine. This is good enough functionality for now. So what we're doing now next is more advanced scenarios. Uh, and that's where you need to know, understand what the filter context is. Okay? Yes. So I, I created a measure, and which actually shows me what the filter context is. So because measures do not only have to return uh, numeric values, but can also return string values. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I've created a measure which actually shows you what is actually being filtered on this particular cell. So in this cell where I'm at, this is filtered by France 2002R, and 2001R, and this is France 2002R. And if I select another value on the slicer, you will see this will change. So this means this particular cell is being filtered by those values on rows, on columns, and also on the uh, slicer. And when I would put calendar year on slicers as well, let's make this a little bit larger. So when I put calendar years, we now see it has automatically does five year rows. So what does, it, what does this mean is, because it now automatically selected all the years, it doesn't use this as, as a filter anymore. It ignores it. So when I select now, again, one year, 2002, you see it automatically switched to 2002. So each and every cell are filtered by uh, slicers and whatever's in row and columns. OK. Uh, so this is showing me information for 2002. 
What if I want to do, uh, how did this year compare with all the other years? Yes, so this is one of those things where, you, where we can use the filter context for. We can also use formulas to set the filter context. And let me show you how that looks like. Go back, we can create a formula, add new measure, and now we can start adding our own measures. So let's do a profit for all years. And something you might notice here in the bottom is we have something new for measures, which is formatting. And this will mean when you have a measure, and those are familiar with, with uh, 2008 R2 Power Pivot, we didn't have this, and now we do. And this means when you set it, whenever you re-add it to the pivot table, you automatically get the formatting with you as well. So in this case, we're gonna uh, profit for all years is gonna be a currency with this symbol and decimal place. So what we now can do is gonna set this filter context. We're gonna ignore it. So let's say calculate. With the calculate, you can start this kind of functions. So you calculate, we do the sum. Uh, sum of, uh, sum of fact internet sales profit. And now we want to set the filter context. We want to override it. And we want to make sure that we, no, we not use the current year, we want to use all the years. So in this case, I want to say, give me all the values for dim date. And I'll show you in a second what now actually happens. If we do check formula, we see no errors in the formula. Press OK. And now it will add, and I'll need to add profit back. Profit. So what we now see is this is the profit which actually uses the filter context of 2002. So this is the profit for 2002, and this is the profit for all the years. So what happens when I change to 2003? You see this profit is changing, and here nothing is changing. Because we said, ignore where in the current filter context that you're in. Always use all years. So if I would change my filter to all, you'll see we have two identical values here. Okay, great. Any questions about filter context so far? This one is a key point because we'll build on it. Yes, sir. Okay, the question is, when you create the measure, where does it live? Is it in the pivot table? Is it in a Power Pivot database? Uh, the answer is it's in the Power Pivot database itself. It's available for anybody, uh, for any other pivot table that go against the uh, Power Pivot database. In fact, a lot of what we'll show later on, you can also do in Excel per pivot table, right? A lot of some formatting options you can also do in uh, for one instance of a pivot table, or you can do it for all instances in the model, right? So you have the option of, uh, of doing that. Any other question? Filter context? Yes, sir. But it's still filtering by the product, is that correct? Yes. So I, I only said in this case, so it's also filtering only, uh, it's still filtering for product line. Yes, that's correct. Because when we overwrite or set the filter context, in this case, I just manually set it to only overwrite for year. In this case, all the years. So you override everything? Yes. We'll Very get to good. that in a second. Good, good. So you're with us. Good. Uh, any, any other questions? No? Okay, great. So um, let's quickly add a percentage of the total. Okay. Because we can... If you have created measures, we can also use those measures. So in this case, I want to do a sum of profit divided by profit for all years. And this is going to be a percentage. Mm -hmm. And this is percentage of all years. Press OK. And now we'll see the percentage of all years here. And I can remove this one because we don't need it anymore. So this is how this particular year does over compared to all the other years. Oh, I see. Can we just see it in a chart or something so we can? Yes. So let's, that's another thing you can do. You can, if you have created a measure in one pivot table, it gets stored inside the model. And because it gets stored inside the model, you can use it on other things in Excel as well. In this case, we want to add a pivot chart. So let's add a pivot chart. And we want to add calendar year. 
and we want to do the percentage of all years added to values. And let's make it a little bit smaller so we can actually see what happens. Okay, so the 41% or the 40.45% we're seeing is for one of these, 2000, the green one is that. So now we can automatically see for each and every year which we have on rows, it, it's comparing the year against everything. So we'll see 2003 did almost 35% of all the sales ever. And we see 2004, which is not yet finished and it's not a completed year. This is almost getting up. So we see every year we do better against the overall sales. All right. Okay, uh, how, do, how do you know uh, uh, each country compared to each other? Can we just do that? Yes. Let's just remove this one and add a new measure. So what we now want to do is we want to override the filter context again. But now we don't want to override the filter context with something specific. We want the filter context to be smart. So let's do that. Uh, we do a profit of grand total. And again, this is a currency. And again, we can override filter context here. And we can do the sum of gross profit for all selected. And what this thing automatically does is it will automatically recognize what the filter context is that you're in. So whatever you happen to have on rows and on columns, it automatically shows that. So in this case, it will always show you the value of uh, the grand total, but you can still slice by slicers. So, so this automatically detects what's on row and columns. You don't have to think about what you need to override. It always shows you the grand total or, or the visual totals concept in analysis services. Right, so irrespective of what I have in rows and columns, I could have put in something else. Uh, maybe yes, so if you would put it in year or if you put it in product, it, it automatically recognizes what's on row and columns and it would automatically override that to automatically <coughs> show the same value as we did in grand totals. Mm -hmm. How about uh, contribution of each country to the total? Yes, so we already get now the grand total so we can add a percentage as well. Okay. So we can use that again and we can, see, we can do the sum of pro profit divided by uh, profit of grand total. And again, this will be a percentage. Check formulas, okay. And we'll see those values get added. And we can remove this one and spice it up a little bit. So because these are all numbers and the numbers doesn't say a lot to me. I can, I can barely read that Australia is doing better than the United States, this is especially for ground. <laughs> and now we can add some colors as well. So we do conditional formatting, color scales. And these are just native Excel 2010 functionalities. We can use them in native Excel pivot tables, but also in our Power Pivot pivot tables. Mm -hmm. So let's add this as well, conditional formatting, data bars. We can actually immediately see what the values are. So now we, we can better see what we are doing here. Okay, great. Uh, how about ranking? Can we just, uh, ranking is a very common thing that we want to do in BI. How, how about, can we just rank these countries based on their profit? Yes, so rank is a very common BI concept. And we have some slides on that to actually show you the concept. Very easy. So how do, we, how do you calculate a rank? Well, you calculate a rank by comparing a value within a list of values. So in this case, I want to compare the value of six within this list of values. And in BI, it's often the case that we automatically want to compare it against the maximum value. So you want to see who's doing best. So in this case, value of six compares second in this total list of values. So how we just compare in our example? So we have a list of values, which is the profit per country, right? And we want to compare the profit for each and every country against this list of values. And on the, yes, and this will determine the rank. So what do we have within PowerPivot? 
So you're going to first, let's take a look at how do we get the list of values. Yes. Right? So what are we going to do in Power Pivot? We have a rank x function. And the rank x function has a few parameters. And first of all, it's the first parameters are to determine what this list of values is. In this case, our list of values is all the countries. Because I want to compare my country to all the countries. So I want to give this table to my rank x. Rank x, all the countries, and for all these countries within this list, I want to determine the profit. And once we have this list created. OK, so the first two parameters of rank x result, there is a table. And there's an expression that's evaluated for each row of the table. And the result is the set with which you are going to look up into, right? So, so far, the first function, which is all countries, just give me a list of countries back, irrespective of my filter context, irrespective of which cell I was in. Just said, release the context, give me the list of all countries. I have a list of countries. And then for each one of those rows in that table, names of countries, I'm going to evaluate profit, essentially getting this table back. Right? So, OK, now I have a list of values. Yes. And so now I'll we want to compare it against some measure. In this case, we want to just compare it against the profit measure. Because the profit measure automatically uses the filter context that it's in. So it knows that which country it's, it it's in. Okay. And this will determine the rank. And let's switch back and actually show you what happens. What does it see? See, yes. For the power pivot, we create a new measure. And we do a rank by profit. And this will be a number, whole number. And this is going to be rank X for all dim sales territory countries by sum of gross profit for the, oh, every value within this list. So that'll give me the list of possible values. Yes. And we want to compare it against the sum of sum profit. profit. Okay. So we do check formula, press OK. And this will actually show me the list of ranks. OK, can and you sort that somehow? Yeah. Yes. You can automatically sort it. And again, this is just by default Excel behavior, it's just sorting in a pivot table. Mm -hmm. And we, we see something strange here. We see NA come up. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean? NA is, that's a row inside my data warehouse. Because a lot of data warehouses often have an NA row for if they cannot find any values for it. So they put it against the NA value. In this case, the NA value doesn't have any values. But because we get a list of all the countries, we get this value back as well. And it's being used in rank. So, but I don't want to have this function. I don't want to see this value. So we can extend, expand our DAX to actually do not, do not show it. So let's edit the formula. And we can just go in and take a look for each and every row. Does this row actually have a sum of gross profit? And we can just simply do that by if the sum of gross profit is larger than zero, then execute the rank for me. Otherwise, return a blank. And blank is automatically ignored by uh, Excel. Mm -hmm. Yes? If you have a negative profit, i.e. loss, that would be excluded as well. So I won't just exclude your NA profit. Yes, that's true. But just want to repeat, or is that? So, uh, yes. so uh, I think the, the observation is, uh, if you have a negative value, you're going to exclude it. Very good. In fact, maybe we should change it. Maybe you should use is blank. So there is a function called is blank also. You're absolutely right that uh, we, should, uh, we should probably use the is blank function to say, if it's blank, then you'd return blank. Otherwise, return the rank. What about the uh, uh, is, If it's blank, then you want to. Oh, other, the other way around. So I can't hear you, Matt. Say again. Oh, there's like an A function, rank A, rank X. Yes. So the question is, uh, when, you, when you were typing it in, there were some other set of functions, rank A, uh, uh, rank dot EQ, rank dot uh, AV, uh, average or A. And those are uh, also exist in Excel. And what they say is, uh, take two parameters. They say, give me this. A value that I'm comparing and a column that contains all the list of possible values, right? Here, uh, that's usually used for calculated columns. Whenever you, when you have a list of values already somewhere that you want to compare against, then you can use the rank function just like you do in Excel. 
Rank X is the one that took a table expression, right? Took a table and then evaluated an expression for it. And this is true of a lot of DAX in general is there are the Excel functions where we are very tight on the semantics and we match uh, whatever Excel would give you. So Excel has a rank .eq and a rank .avg. So we implement the same functions here, but they don't work for measures because you don't have the list of all possible values materialized somewhere that you can use. So all the extensions that we're adding to the Excel language, we extend with the X saying this is specific to DAX. So there's a rank, there's a DAX rank function called rank X, which takes a table and expression. So the question is, the, actually, the function implementation of rank A, rank X, whether that excludes nulls or not? Yeah. That's a good question. I don't, I don't know that function well, well enough to answer that question. No. You can always say uh, remove is blank. That's what we've done. But it may be the case that we can also. So maybe this, this is a good point to tell people that when CDP3 comes out afterwards, we will have a white paper on DAX. So there currently is a white paper on DAX already, in the current existing language, but we'll, we'll have a new updated version for the DAX white paper, and this will probably contain those. Yeah, there may be the fourth parameter to it, may be that one. I don't remember the parameter list, but it may be that one. Yes. Okay, great. So we've done uh, ranking. This is a very common BI problem. That's why uh, uh, DAX introduced the rank function. How about, I want to do marketing impact. So if I want to see gains versus last year, how do I do that? Yes. So one of my favorite functions in Power Pivot are time intelligence functions. And with time intelligence functions, you can play around with time. You can, you can do time traveling. And one of those things, uh, there are a few prerequisites for it to actually get it to work in Power Pivot. Mm -hmm. and, and that is, DAX need to know what the years are. DAX need to know what actually the dates are that you're working against. So if we go back to our Power Pivot window, we'll see dim date, and we see fact internet sales. So every sales has relationships with date. We have order dates, due dates, ship date, and I can navigate to the related table, and this will show us my date table. And as you can see here, and as this would be the same with a lot of data warehouses, the keys that are being used are integer values. They're not date values, but how does DAX know how to navigate back one year if it has an integer value? So DAX needs date columns. DAX need date columns to actually work. And you can get this to work in a lot of different ways, but in Denali we introduced a much more simpler way. We can tell our model that this table is a date table and it contains a date. Mm -hmm. so we can go to design, yes. <laughs> Mark as date table, date table settings, and it automatically picks the date column, press OK, and that's all there is to it. Now we can start playing around with our time intelligence functions. So new measure, profit, last year, currency, and again we can play with filter context because we are going to look at the current year and we want to go back one year. So we use the current filter context to determine what the, what the current year is and how to move back and forth into it. So we again we're going to use calculate. This is a function that you're going to use a lot. Sum of gross profit. But now we want to time travel. And there are a lot of functions available in Power Pivot by default. So let's say I want to do a total year to date, a total quarter to date, uh, a lot of dates in between, dates period. You can do a lot of stuff. But in this case, we just want to go previous year. You see previous day, month, quarter. Let's just do previous year. And previous year needs to use the date column to navigate on. And that's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. We do check formula, no expressions, press OK, and now it will go back one year. So let's, let's remember, Australia had 588,000, go back one year, and you see Australia now has 588,000. So it actually did travel back a year. But while we're in 2003, so it knows, thanks to the filter context, how to go back and forth in time, because we selected it. So now we want to, to calculate the gain. 
Mm -hmm. We can add a new measure and do the sum of gross, uh, sum of profit divided by the profit last year minus one. And again, this will going to show up our sum of sales amount, uh, our NA. So we're going to do is blank of dim sales third, uh, dim some profit of some profit. If that's the true, show blank. Otherwise, calculate the value. And this will return as a percentage. So this is profit gain over last year. So now we'll see how we did compared to last year. And let's remove profit from last year as well. And one of the interesting things here to do is you again use those default Excel visualization options. Data bars are great for this. So let's add a data bar. And now we automatically see how we did compared to last year. And we'll see something interesting because we were looking for how to differentiate, right? Because we, my manager wants to see uh, how each and every country did. And we want to go into new countries and we want to see which country we can steal some, how they are doing it from. Mm -hmm. And the sum of gross profit is, might be good in Australia and the UK, but boy, they're not doing good compared to last year. And the UK is 31% better. And that's actually quite a significant gain. So they might be doing something good in the marketing department. And so so that, that's pretty interesting. Okay, great. Uh, let me get back. Uh, I just remembered, pause. Matt, a question that you asked about rank. I was just thinking about it while he was talking. Uh, there are a set of functions. It's a key point, so I wanted to enforce it. Excel has 260 or 270 different functions. DAX language implements about 150 of those functions, right? And every release, we add on more. So for example, standard deviation functions ex exist in Excel, a variance and standard deviation. They did not exist in DAX. Uh, we just need to make sure they're scalable enough and we get uh, enough uh, uh, performance out of them. So every release, we're adding new and new functions. For the rank one, in particular the one you mentioned, uh, we haven't implemented the rank M function that you mentioned. We've only implemented rank.eq. So that one, you'll just have to uh, uh, depend on whatever the semantics for EQ are, uh, not M. Okay, great. So how about, uh, is, is this looking at order? Uh, what does it mean by the year? Is it the orders that we got within a year, or is it orders that we shipped during that year? So yes. So what we just saw, and when I went back to my day table, is we have multiple relationships. This was something we didn't have in the previous release. When we previously, when we imported data into our Power Pivot, it just took the first relationship that we had and dropped all the rest. So if there are multiple relationships between two tables, yes. we just pick one. And we just pick one. Okay. And now it will import all the relationships between those tables. And there's one difference between, uh, what it actually does is it picks one and creates an active relationship for that one. Okay. And the active relationship is being used by Excel. So this is what you see here. The active relationship is what's being used. And the active relationship in this case is the order date. So whatever we use inside this pivot table, is being used by the active relationship. So but let me just uh, say it another way, which is if I had two tables and I selected uh, in a pivot table, I used columns from both of those two tables, then by default, the DAX engine would use the active relationship across those t two tables to yes. reconcile numbers, right? How do I use the inactive? So the inactive relationships, the other relationships that we have here, we can use using DAX. And it's a pretty simple, uh, to, to actually show. So let's show it. Yeah, can we look at the relationship first just to make sure people see it? Yeah, I don't think I need to wait too long. Okay. Yes, so let's go to the fact internet sales and the dim date. And we see here now three lines between each table. So we have the order date key, we have the due date key, and we have the ship date key. So all of those are now related to this date table. Yes. Which version is pertinent to the one that has multiple relationships? 
So we, you mean which version of Power Pivot? Has that so this version of Power Pivot is the one that's going to come with SQL Denali. No. Okay. So, so the current version of Power Pivot. So everything we show here is uh, the new version of Power Pivot, which is coming out with SQL Denali. Yeah, there are a few set of functions, like the all selected is introduced here, rank is introduced now. Uh, a lot of the concept, the tables and relationship already existed in Power Pivot, but we're extending it forward. Now there's another for those familiar with role, uh, sorry, role playing dimensions in analysis services, right? What you have is, what you want to have is uh, order date or ship date, uh, either dimension or table that the users see within their field list. Right? So instead of doing uh, per relationship, per calculation saying use this relationship to navigate across, you just want to make it a, a structural thing. You want to put it into the metadata instead of putting it into the calculation. That's something we couldn't get done in Denali. But that's something that we're, it's very high on the list for a future version. So the users that want to use this data themselves don't have to go through DAX and say you know, use this new function for picking an inactive relationship. They should just see uh, ship date, due date as tables, and then use columns from those tables uh, naturally within the pivot table. That was because you directly connected to the data warehouse, right? Say, if you are connected to an analysis services queue, mm -hmm. you already have the role-playing dimensions there, mm -hmm. then that wouldn't yes. be there. Yes, yes. Okay, great. So let me just uh, repeat what he said. What we're doing here is there's data warehouse. We brought data into Power Pivot, and now we are analyzing using pivot tables on top of it, right? You could take the pivot tables and go directly against another cube that's running somewhere. So your same data warehouse, you may have built a cube. And then from pivot table, you can go directly against that uh, analysis services, bypassing power pivot altogether. That is still true. So analysis services, the multi-dimensional projects, have the notion of role-playing dimensions, and they'll just show up as dimensions to pivot table. Right? In this case, we're going down the, pivot, uh, the power pivot stack. Right? We're saying, our data warehouse, I brought it into uh, the uh, Power Pivot, which is a tabular project, essentially. And now I'm going into, uh, into uh, pivot tables on top. The tabular projects don't have support for role-playing dimensions yet. Yes, sir? I, uh, what I heard in the last, in this morning's last hour last year, It's a great, great question. So what he said is, if you have a, a data warehouse already, you've built a cube, and now you want to build Power Pivot on top, there's a lot of work that you already did in the cube. You define dimensions, you define measures, you define security. A lot of that was already there. Can we derive a Power Pivot model, which essentially layers on top of what has been defined on analysis services? Great. Not in this version, right? <laughs> in this version, it's, it's a great scenario. Uh, in, uh, in this version, what you end up doing is Power Pivot imports data, and it's, uh, um, it's quite uh, agnostic of the data source. So what you don't get, what, if you connect to analysis services, you can import data back, but it's all a flat, uh, flat list, a flat uh, row set, essentially, that you got back. So you lose all the calculation definitions, and you lose the hierarchy information. That's something that is, uh, I should say, not, not, not in this release. It's not in CTP3, which is what you'll get in the summer. It's still on a list of things that we want to push in uh, uh, for the release, but I'm not very confident of that. Yes, sir. So you're saying that you're going to modify VertiPack in the future where it's not just two-dimensional, but it can actually be three-dimensional, like the analysis queue? No, but I don't think role-playing dimension is more than it's multidimensional. What it actually does is it creates a sort of copy of the same table multiple times and just gives it a different name. So yeah, just, th just think of in relational databases, you have aliases, right? So you have, uh, you have a one date table. You don't want to keep all the possible dates over and over again. And you just want to alias the date table. You want to say, this is my order date, and I want to use my order relation. Or this is my ship date. I want to use a ship, relation, uh, ship date relationships. And that's the, still in the tabular model. You're not going to the dimensional model yet. I'm not saying we're adding role-playing dimensions to uh, Power Pivot. What I'm saying is, that facility of having aliases defined on tables, roles defined on tables, that one table can play different roles, that's something that's very valuable for Power Pivot. 
So you don't have to suddenly, uh, great, thank you for asking that. You don't have to now suddenly start learning about multidimensional uh, just to use Power Pivot. You'll still be tabular in nature. It just extend with that functionality. Yes, I think, I think we'll keep your question for later. Just we, need, we need to get going. So sure. one of the things that we're actually we're doing where we wanted to use those inactive relationships, those other relationships. So how can we do that? Well, again, we can use overriding or setting the filter context. We can again going to use calculate. And we do the sum of gross profit. And in this case, we're just going to say use relationship dim date, date key with fact internet sales and the ship date key. And that's it. Now it's going to use it's going to calculate the sum of gross profit using the other relationship. And you can use this in any other function. We could have picked the sum of gross, of, sum of gross profit for previous year measure. And this would have, again, given us the sum of gross profit for previous year using the other relationship. We can do the rank, it, uh, again, yep. the same thing. So it will just say to the DAX, for this particular measure which you are calculating, use the other relationship. Press OK, and now we will see different values. They're not that different, but they're a little bit different, so it means that we actually uh, ship right after something is ordered. Okay, so UK is still doing pretty, uh, pretty decent. How do I, who can I call in the UK to get more information? Yes, so uh, I have, I know the data warehouse, and luckily we imported the employee table as well. So we have sales, we have sales territory, and belonging to territory, we have employees. And if we look at this employee table, so we now want to find out who is actually our sales rep in the UK, and which actually has a phone number as well, so we can know who to call. Mm -hmm. um, so we go to the employee table, and what we see here is a flat table of employees. But this flat table of employees has some additional information in it. It has a parent-child. Uh, uh, relationship to itself. So that means employee number one, Mr. Guy Gilbert, has his boss, which is defini defined in the parent employee uh, key number 18. Mm -hmm. So Mr. with the key number 18 is the parent of, of the boss of Mr. Guy Gilbert. So in Parpiv Denali, we introduce parent child functions as well. And this is quite different than it is in analysis service. It's not a dynamic parent child. It's a DAX formula. And in this DAX formula, and I'll just scroll to the right, we'll see a path here. So what we actually do is we create a path between the current employee and the top. And what this does is, it's just an easy function, is the path use the employee key with the parent employee key. And what this does, it traverses back up the hierarchy. So employee with key number one has a boss with employee key number 18, with, and he has a boss with employee key number 23, and he has a boss with employee number 112. And what the benefit of this is, this is just a string value which is being populated inside my model. And because this is a calculated column, this gets only calculated on refresh time. So this will be blazing fast. Yeah, yeah that's one of the uh, lessons we learned from the multidimensional projects, which is parent-child, great structural uh, concept, very easy to do. But it does have, on high uh, on, uh, large scale, it has some performance issues because it, the server is only able to create aggregations at the bottom and top. Uh, so this way, you get the benefit of having a parent-child hierarchy and the speed of, uh, uh, of VertiPak and uh, persisted columns that you can then access. Yes, and one of the things I want to highlight here is you see this column has a different color. And this is because I've hidden the column. So I, you can hide columns in Power Pivot, so you can actually play with them yourselves inside the Power Pivot model, but you don't want them to show up inside your pivot tables. Mm -hmm. And it, this will turn a different color. So this only gave us the, the path. How do I get yes. the actual names? So I created some calculated columns for each and every level. And this will give us the benefit that we can actually use those uh, relationship paths. In this case, you can get items from that path by using a simple function called path item. So in this case, path item one gives us employee with key number 112. Mm -hmm. But we, do just, we just don't want to give our employees key 
keys because they don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. So we want to look up a value inside this table. We want to get the last name that belongs to this key. So we have another function we introduced. This is called lookup value. And lookup value, in this case, we can look up the value of a, the last name of an employee where the employee key is the first item in our path. This is, in this case, 112. So this will give us all the employees uh, with, um, with key number 112, which in this case only is the manager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's what analysis services did. Yeah, that's what I mentioned. In, uh, in, a, multi in the multidimensional project, that's right. That's so, you know, that's the way you the column, right? the so, so what it actually does here ah. is... Ah, okay. So, good question, uh, which is the path... Uh, can you go back to the lookup value? Mm -hmm. Lookup value is oh, yeah. a function that doesn't require relationships. You can look up across any other table, across your same table, uh, any table you want to look up to without navigating through a relationship, uh, that's what the lookup value function allows you to do. You say the lookup value function is able to be coded in a way that will result in quicker than if you had um, materialized that same feature relationship. Okay, the question is about performance of lookup value versus related, if essentially. Uh, the uh, relationship one will give you higher performance because we uh, create some. Uh, some secondary structures to help you navigate faster. Lookup value is more dynamic, uh, although in this case, lookup value is used as a calculated column. So it will be performance of materializing at the time that you define it. It's not a runtime because it's a calculated column, so it's always materialized, right? It's not a measure. Yes. If you use it in a measure, then it would do dynamic uh, lookups against the other, uh, other table without going through a persisted uh, join cache. Okay, so. Maybe you can talk uh, later on. Yes, so I created levels here, and these are just the same, but just every time you use another part item. So now I have all these levels, and now I can get them into a hierarchy, because we want to use this in a hierarchy. So I go back to my diagram, scroll down on my employee table, and down here we see I've created a hierarchy, I've dragged in all the levels, and now I want to use this in my pivot table. I want to, we wanted to find the actual person who was uh, who is available, who's working in, in the UK, and who actually has a phone number as well. Mm -hmm. So let's get a new sheet. Let's add a pivot table, existing worksheets, and let's go to our employee. And you'll now see organization hierarchy here. I can click it, and now we'll see this is the, the big boss, of course. And we want to make sure that it actually has a phone number, so let's add a count of phone numbers. So in total hierarchy has 269 phone numbers, but we wanted to look at specifically the employees who are in England, right? Yeah. So let's add a slicer again. In the UK. Uh, in the UK, yes. We need to add country. So UK, we see it now slice down all the employees which are in this particular country. So now we can go and find them. In this case, it's Mr. Pak, which is the lowest person inside this uh, hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And let's go and find his, his phone number. I can just double click on this measure and it will actually drill through to my underlying table, my underlying further pack table, which is in, in our uh, PowerPivot model. So this will give me a filter down, depending on what the filter context was, it knows what the actual table was underneath in the, my PowerPivot table. So in this case, it shows me the data for the phones for, we, for this particular hierarchy in the UK. And now we can actually go up and look up the phone number. And here we have the phone number, which is in this table. And now we can just go ahead and call him. Okay, great. So that was a quick view of uh, DAX as a calculation language, right? So a few enhancements that we've done. We looked at uh, a lot of, uh, go back to slides. We looked at a lot of things. We looked at tables and relationships. We looked at calculated columns. How do you define them? Uh, we looked at implicit measures, drag and drop into values, uh, which are automatic measures. We looked at also custom measures, where you type in your own uh, formulas. We looked at the filter context and how do you change filter context? How do you how do you discover what filter context is and how do you change it using all, all selected, or uh, use relationship if you want to use a different context to move across. 
Uh, we looked at uh, rank uh, function, looked at time intelligence functions, uh, multiple relationships, and parent child. So there's a lot of stuff we just went through just uh, uh, for you to realize. Now, if we can hold off on questions now, because I want to talk about DAX as a query language next, and then we'll take questions. We have about a little under 15 minutes left, and I'll uh, hold off questions until then. Okay. So uh, before I get to DAX as a query language, DAX is everything you saw here was in Power Pivot. We showed you in uh, Excel. The same thing is also available. Same functionality is also available inside tabular projects within Visual Studio with, with Denali. Right? So in my session on Tuesday, we showed that. I think Julie showed it also yes. yesterday. Uh, so same, it's the same uh, engine that works in both places. In the professional environment, in the uh, Visual Studio environment, you also have new facilities. So you have something called role-level security, which is not in Power Pivot. So in role-level security, what you want to do is say, if I connect, I should see data for India. If Casper connects, he should see data for uh, Netherlands. And uh, you want to have a dynamic security, also defined. And there is a new function in DAX called username that allows you, just like in MDX, there's a username function. Uh, in DAX also, there is a username function that allows you to say, OK, I, I now get the identity of the user that's querying, the, the, uh, the username of the uh, user that's querying, and I can look that up against my lookup table that gives me the appropriate permissions. Right? So that's, there's a username function introduced as well. This is the BI semantic model. Uh, we talked about DAX as a calculation language. Uh, on the session on Tuesday, I also talked about uh, we also talked about having uh, Excel have a multidimensional access, so sending MDX, and uh, Crescent sending DAX as a query language. So Crescent is very tabular in nature. Uh, you don't see dimensions and measure groups. You all see uh, only thing that you see are tables and columns. And you can use those tables and columns just like you do in Power Pivot field list. Uh, and uh, the way uh, Crescent discovers metadata, is it connects to the model, and says, give me back metadata in an entity form. So give me back a, uh, a CSDL definition, uh, not, in, uh, not a dimensional definition, not dimensions and measures. Just give me entities and properties. Uh, and then once it gets that metadata in relational, f in tabular form, then it sends queries also in tabular form. So you could have, you, and you can have a mix. You can have a client that discovers metadata using entities, but then sends MDX queries. You can have a client that's discovering uh, 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 dimensional metadata and sending DAX queries also, right? So it's a flexibility of choice. So DAX uh, results are always tables. They always return uh, row set. MDX always returns cell sets back, right? So if you are building a kind of a reporting-like application that's looking at metadata in a tabular form, then you can also send tabular queries. And the reason we used DAX instead of going to SQL is that DAX is already uh, uh, has functions that return tabular table value functions. Uh, so we just have a very thin shim around the DAX language, uh, which then uh, returns cell set back to, uh, to the clients that are asking for it. And we can take a look at what that looks like. Yeah, let's just take a look at what that looks like. Let's see. Yes, so I've connected. Uh, to my analysis services running in tabular project mode in the new SSMS shell, which is also uh, migrated to Visual, to Visual Studio 2010 shell, like uh, BI Development Studios as well. And I've connected to it, and you can notice it by the icon. It's different than an uh, analysis services MOLAP icon. And this is a server running in tabular mode, and I have two databases. And we see here we have tables, and this actually is the same uh, workbook I restored on the server. So I picked up my Power Pivot workbook, I went to the database, and I did restore from Power Pivot, and just added it to the database. Mm -hmm. And now I can define row level security, I can define partitions, and I can load in as many rows as my server can handle. Mm -hmm. um, so now I want to query it. So I'll open up a file that I already have, and you will already see something strange, .mdx. So what does this mean? It's an, MDX, it's an MDX editor, but we want to demo DAX queries. Yes. So what does it mean? I connect to the MDX query editor, and we're going to use DAX queries. Mm -hmm. 
And this means because our engine is smart enough to automatically recognize what kind of query you're sending is, you can, you can do one connection to the analysis services, doesn't matter what analysis services it is, and you can send either MDX or DAX. And the engine automatically recognizes what kind of query you're sending and will return the appropriate result. So in this case, let me just query a table. I start with evaluate of DIM product. And this is the table I have in my, in my, uh, in my model. So just execute the value. And we now automatically see all the values in this table. Mm -hmm. So just evaluate of a table, that's enough to start the query. And now we get to return all the values. And let me show you a more uh, advanced example. Is where I actually can define my own tables. Uh, my, I can actually define my own measures within queries. So in this case, I have a query where I want to see the gross profit, which I haven't defined in my model. And I want to define it on the spot in for this particular query alone. Just say define measure. And the measure is being placed in the fact internet sales. It's called gross profit. And it has to do the sum of sales amount minus total product cost. So for this query, we now have this measure. This measure doesn't get, will not get stored inside the model. This measure is only for this query mm -hmm. in this particular instance. So what I want to do here is I want something more interesting. I want to summarize my fact table by English product name and calendar year. So it will actually group my in fact internet sales by English product name and calendar year. And for those columns that actually show up, I will see the total sales, which is the sum of fact internet sales amount and the gross profit. And this is the new measure we just created. And as you can see, we already have a big difference here between DAX queries and SQL is we didn't have to do any inner joins. We are using three different tables. We didn't have to do any inner joins. And that's because DAX is aware of the relationships between tables. You, it automatically knows which way it can go and automatically knows what it can do. So we don't have to define relationships if we want. And we'll come back, we'll go to questions in a few minutes. So this, this is just, we're almost done. So let's, let's execute this because this will return a table and this table can be ordered by calendar year and total sales. So let's execute it. And we'll now see all the fact internet sales grouped by English product name, dim date, ordered by calendar year, so we see all the years first, and then the, the highest sales amount on top. So this is very briefly and very short what you can do with DAX as a query language. Mm -hmm. And this is what Crescent also does. Crescent creates DAX queries on the fly as you are dragging and pulling and playing around with your data. They are creating DAX queries and doing, sending fast. You seen Crescent was pretty responsive, pretty, pretty fast. They're just building DAX queries on the spot and executing them. So because this is all in memory for the pack engine, they are very, very quick. Okay. Can you? Also yes, I can also run MDX queries just the same way as I as, as I was doing DAX queries. I can also run MDX queries. So let's let's finish up. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, what is new in Denali? There are a few other functions that we didn't actually get a chance to show. Uh, for those that have used DAX, a lot of these are very useful and you'll recognize the value. One is switch, which a lot of us do nested ifs. If this, then do this. Else, if is, then do this. Else, if is, then do this. Switch is just a much more uh, uh, user-friendly way of expressing that syntax. Uh, top n, just like rank x, top n is one that says, give me the top five uh, uh, products based on sales in uh, the UK for 2003. So just, it's a very, uh, it's another nugget that uh, encapsulates very common BI questions that people ask. Statistical function, I mentioned this uh, previously. We, would, we did, uh, did not have this in 2008 R2. We now have standard deviation and variance. Uh, has one value. A lot of people that played with DAX before uh, ended up saying, if count of values is equal one, then do something. Otherwise, do something else. Uh, now, finally, we have one function that encapsulates that, which is has one value which if you've used DAX before, you know the value of this. Uh, if you haven't used the DAX, then you, what's the big deal? Uh, it's one of those uh, conveniences. 
So to review, DAX, uh, specifically for Denali, uh, DAX was designed to have a very low barrier to entry and to scale up to the complexity of BI analysis. Uh, you saw some of that complexity here. Uh, uh, SQL 11 simplified authoring of formulas. So we use the rank function. We use all selected. We use uh, the stop n. Uh, so you're just making it more and more um, usable now for BI cases. And uh, DAX, in Denali, DAX is being introduced as a query language also. So you can have uh, calculations. Uh, just, just to be clear on this, in the BI semantic model, you can define calculations in DAX. You can use MDX or DAX as queries language against that model, right? So two different things. DAX as a query language, distinct than DAX as a, as a calculation language. OK, great. So related content, uh, the session, in case you didn't catch them, the first session is what, where we introduced what we're doing in Denali, the concept of multidimensional projects and tabular projects, and what is the BI semantic model. Second session was all about Crescent. So if you wanted to see more about what Crescent is capable of, that's, uh, you can listen to the recording for that. There's some hands-on labs and a demo station. There is a blog uh, that our team has, analysis services team has, uh, which is just the Power Pivot and Analysis Services blog. There's also a DAX white paper out there today, which was for 2008 R2. And a lot of the concepts that we talked about, a lot of the functions that we use, are already in Power Pivot, so you can just start off uh, uh, using DAX there. We'll provide an update to that with all the Denali functions a little bit later on in the year. So, uh, and we'll post a link to that in the blog site as well. Yes, and what, one other thing we want to do is the workbook you just saw, all the things that we want to do, we want to give that out as well on the blog. Uh, whenever CDP3, comes, CDP3 becomes available, we want to share this workbook we just saw as well. So you can play around with it yourself and see it yourself what we're actually doing. Okay, great. Now, before we uh, open up for questions, thank you very much for coming. Please fill out the evaluations if you can. <laughs> Hope it was useful. Yes, sir. Now, questions. Okay. Um, can you please move to the mic as well? And, uh, oh, well, that'll be great. Then we don't have to repeat. Yeah. All right. So, the first question was in terms of uh, you showed the uh, MDX, but can that actually be generated uh, from the work that you're doing in Power Pivot, i.e., uh, the that is creating um, MDX queries underneath the shell. Can you actually uh, have it give you those if you wish to record them separately? So uh, the actual work that we're doing is not generating MDX queries on the shell. It's MDX is a query language, and the queries are being sent, are being translated by the analysis services formula engine into storage mode queries. Yeah, let me try to rephrase it. Maybe I, uh, I heard something different than okay. you did, perhaps, uh, which is, as you're using pivot tables, the pivot Excel is generating MDX statements to Power Pivot. Uh, your question, I think, was, can you look at those MDX statements that are being sent? You can. Is that right? You can? You can. You can start a SQL Server profiler. So this is to Power Pivot. He wants to see okay. what is the in-memory. So no. if you're going against, if a pivot table is going against a standalone server, then you can just run profiler against that server. You can get those events. Against the in-memory one, there is no way to capture events that are going there. So there is no, uh, there's no facility for you to No, but that. what you can do is if you create a, uh, a workbook and you want to see what the MDX, you can restore it to your server and connect with Excel to the server because you can just connect with the normal Excel to the uh, tabular project in, on the server, just like you would connect to an analysis service MOLAB multidimensional, and then start profiler and start playing around. Then you can see the MDX is being sent. Yeah, you can also, I think through VBA, you may be able to get to the MDX statements, although I'm not positive. So I'll need to talk to somebody from Excel to actually answer that question. Yes. It seems like the logical way that you go and find the next project. understand what's going on. Yes, yes, yes. So if there's any change to the underlying data, that the power pivot got. How, how do we, you know, how does that get reflected? Why don't you just the make a change to the underlying data? So, uh, to which one? Power pivot. Just change something. Just uh, add a new calculator. column. My question was like in the in the is there is it connected to the database from from? Okay, all right. So or? there are different. Uh, so again, you now there are three tiers, right? There's a database. Yes. There's power pivot model, and there's pivot table on top. Right. So if, if the database changes underneath. Uh, power Pivot is just like analysis services today, which is if your okay. query 
is only looking at the data that, uh, at the information that hasn't changed, it's fine. It is, uh, a tree fell down in the forest, nobody was there to see it, you didn't know anything. Uh, if the data act, if the metadata changed, for example, or if the data changed, uh, if the data changed, then you'll have to refresh yourself. If the metadata changed, the next time you refresh, the, will depend on the provider to do the conversion between the, uh, the type that we have and the type in the database. So if, you, if the provider supports a type conversion, then it's transparent to you. Everything worked fine. Oh. If you rename a column and uh, your query is still depend on that, then uh, it doesn't. It'll give you an error saying, hey, I can't find this, uh, find this column. So, so it's just like, then you have to go into the database and do it. Now, if, if the change happened at the power pivot layer, right, not at the database, but at the power pivot layer, then in the pivot table, uh, in the power pivot field list, you will get a notification saying your data has changed press here to refresh, ah. right? And then that'll refresh all the metadata that the pivot tables have for off power pivot. So if you define a new calculated column, for example, you went back to pivot table, then you'll see a, uh, uh, on, the, on the toolbar, you'll see something has changed. So I now re rename the column, and it automatically says the power pivot data was modified, and refresh. When you, ref when you refresh, it automatically refreshes the pivot table, and it get gives me my new name. Yeah. So those two are Integrated. Thanks. Hi. Will we be able to see the DAX queries that Crescent creates? Yes, you can do the same profile or trace as. Uh, so you can go to Visual Management Studio, mm -hmm. Tools, SQL Profiler, and I don't have Crescent running, but uh, you can just connect to your analysis services running in uh, in, uh, in memory mode, mm -hmm. and. Start a profiler. And just trace it all the and just trace it. We added a lot of new trace events. Yeah, this one is actually the existing trace event. Query begin, query end. Yeah. It just has a, sub a subtype. I, which I saw that the other day. In yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. That's all you need to do. Okay. You just need to see DAX queries. Thanks. Sorry? I thought SQL uh, the profiler is being replaced with a new. SQL profiler is not being replaced in Denali. It is. <laughs> It is coming in now. It will. It uh, the curly defense um, view, or whatever it's called. Okay, so that's different. Uh, it's about yes. profiler traces versus X events, right? X events are the more uh, lower overhead uh, events. In Denali, both will be available. Uh, analysis Services is investing in both as well. So X event wasn't there before. Now we're adding support for X event. But All the events that you got in profiler also are in X events, and because X event is low overhead. Now, any new events that we're adding, we're now choosing. Should we add it only to X events or to both? Right? So the new trace events, for example, we added many more events for locking and for resource use utilization. We added them to both. We said, hey, if you're using Profiler, you should get what locks are you waiting for, what locks are you acquiring or releasing. Uh, but we're looking at whether you know, uh, some very, uh, uh, very inner loopish uh, events, uh, loops, Events that can be raised very uh, high bandwidth, should we just use them for X events or not? But both are there. Supporting DMVs as well, I hope you're following. Huh? DMVs as well, if we're going down that path. Yes, DMVs have been supported in analysis services since 2000. Yes, that's right. So uh, DMVs, there are lots of new DMVs. There are some around uh, the in-memory, the VertiPak engine. What is in the VertiPak engine, you can discover it through the DMVs. Uh, you know, what are the tables, what are the columns, how much uh, size do they take, and what are the relationships across them. All that can be done through DMVs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in your DAX query, you did show dim date, and that is using the order date by default, right? Yep. I'm assuming that you can also use the relationship and say that I want to use ship date or anything else, correct? Yes, that's what, uh, that's what Casper showed is in, no, the in, the, in the DAX query. In the DAX query? Yes. Yes, in absolutely. In the query right. language, uh, yeah. I mean, right. this we saw, yes. but in the DAX query language, That's right. yes. it, didn't, it was by default using the order date. It, it, right. was, it was using the active relationship. That's, That's right. right. So That's right. there, I'm assuming that you can also specify the relationship. Absolutely yes. right. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Thank you. All of the time intelligence that you showed, is that all Denali only? I didn't know. No, the time intelligence functions are already available in uh, SQL Server 2008 R2. The only thing is, uh, the marking as date table, that's new in Denali. So if you want to use it in, uh, KG, in uh, 2008 R2, you need to do some additional work. And but like previous month and previous year, are you just pass it? 
Yes. Okay. So those are already available. Cool. Yeah, that should work. And the DAX white paper goes through examples of that also yes. that you can use. Yes. Is that now, is that not powerful anymore? Is that something that can be stored on the perfect pack? Data stored on the perfect pack? So actually. Got it. Great, great, good question. So the question was, uh, when we showed Management Studio, we showed connecting against a server, right? And uh, the previous demos were all about Power Pivot. So when does it, when does Power Pivot stop and the server starts? Uh, please look at the presentation I did on Tuesday, uh, because it is, it goes. I'll give you a very quick answer, and for the detailed one, you'll go there. The same technology, which is BI semantic model, can be built in Power Pivot which is embedded database. It can also be built in Visual Studio and deployed to analysis of a standalone analysis services and two different, uh, two different uh, deliverables that we have. You can take a Power Pivot workbook and upload it to analysis services also. And that's what Casper showed is you can just say restore from Power Pivot and essentially takes the BI semantic model that's embedded within the workbook and uh, hydrates, loads it up on uh, a standalone server. What we showed was, uh, uh, SSMS connecting to a standalone server. The same engine is also running in proc. It's just there's no port on which it's listening, so you can't connect to the one that's running in proc within Excel. But it's literally the same engine that's running in both places. Yes, it's yes. using in memory in either case. If uh, you have Power Pivot, it's using the in memory VertiPack engine. If you have a standalone analysis services server in a tabular project, it's using VertiPack engine. If you use multi dimensional project, it's using the OLAP engine that we're all familiar with now. Yes, and one more. Great question. Uh, does it support many to many relationships? Do you it to does. It supports many to many relationships using DAX. So it's not a modeling operation like you're used to in uh, MOLAP. It's, it's using in DAX. And actually, we're just finding out that there are some interesting query uh, language features we added are great for many-to-many -many operations. And you will see a blog post from me about it after we have CDP3 has been released, how to do it. So it's. Yeah, there's some functions we had to add for the DAX as a query language that we didn't get to. Uh, some of them have interesting uh, side effects that uh, many-to-many -many gets much easier in DAX when you use those functions. So we'll, we'll blog about that also. Yes. OK, thank you. We can just uh, take questions here.